today from Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32. And Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there, he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead, and has begun to live, and was lost, and has been found. Good morning to you all. It's good to be with you this morning to share together from God's Word. Luke chapter 15 is a fairly well-known chapter and probably in most of our Bibles the section from verse 11 onwards has the title The Prodigal Son. But I want to suggest to you today that that's not the best title for the parable and I say that for two reasons. First of all, because Jesus himself never referred to the parable by that title. And also because naming it the parable of the prodigal son focuses our mind on one of the people in the parable. There are three and they're all equally important. It could equally be called the extravagant love of a father. Or it could be called the parable of two lost sons. Now, this was probably the first parable that I ever attempted to preach on. And, like so many other people, 
I focused almost exclusively on the story of the young brother. It's a beautiful picture of reconciliation. The reconciliation of a rebellious son with his loving earthly father and how that equates directly with a returning sinner who is received by a loving heavenly father, reinstated to a position of honour in the kingdom and given a new and a clean robe. It's a beautiful illustration of reconciliation. But the parable has so much more to say to us than the story of the young son. And like all of scripture, we need to look at it within the context we find it in the Bible. But also bearing in mind that when Jesus addressed an audience, he had a message that was relevant for everybody in that audience. I want to read the first two verses of chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him, near Jesus, to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now what that tells us is that there were two very distinctive groups of people who came to listen to Jesus that day as he spoke the contents of this chapter. Verse 1 tells us that the tax collectors and sinners were there. And verse 2 tells us that the scribes and the Pharisees were there too. Now these two groups were at the spiritual extremes, at the extremes of the spiritual scale. Now later on in Luke's Gospel we find Jesus spoke another parable that highlights the difference in spiritual attitudes that these two groups had. And I'm talking about the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give a tithe of all that I earn. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. That highlights the different spiritual attitude that these two groups had. The tax collectors and sinners were spiritually lost, and they knew it. The Pharisees and the scribes were equally spiritually lost, except they didn't know it. Now what becomes obvious then is that the story of the young brother equates directly with those tax collectors and sinners, while the story of the older brother equates directly with the scribes and the Pharisees. Let's go on to look at the content of the parable. It says, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. Give me my share of the estate. That was an absolutely shocking request to make. Absolutely shocking. You see, implied behind that statement is that he wanted his father dead. He wanted his father's money, but not his father. We have a saying in Gaelic that translates like this. I like my old man's bread, but I don't like my old man's breath. I like my old man's bread, but I don't like my old man's breath. In other words, I enjoy the financial benefits of being my father's son, but I don't want to be anywhere near my father. And that was certainly the attitude of the young son here except he takes that to extremes and in effect wanted his father dead. 
Now, what becomes obvious also in the chapter, though, is the extravagant love of this father. You see, in this society and culture, the father ruled the household with an iron fist. And if any son had dared to make this request, he could only expect to be beaten to pulp by his father, thrown out of the family home and disowned completely. But not this father. Now, by way of background, when our father had two sons, the older of the two would receive a double portion. In other words, he would receive two-thirds of the estate and the younger son would receive one-third. Now, this young son's request was going to cost his father and cost him dearly. It was going to cost him financially. It was going to cost him reputationally. And it was also going to cost him emotionally. Now, wealthy men didn't store their money in bank accounts. What they did was they acquired more and more land. So the only way that this father could give his young son a third of the estate was to sell a third of his land. That was costing him financially. But it was also costing him reputationally because a man's standing in the community was directly li linked to the extent of his land ownership. And it would also become public knowledge as to why he had disposed of a third of his land to fund his rebellious young son. And it was costing him emotionally. Here was very public rejection by his own son, publicly humiliated by his younger son. And normally, the reaction to rejection is to lash out at the person who is doing the rejecting. But not this father. He had an extravagant love for his sons. We simply read that he divided his wealth between them. And so the young son then, he prepares to leave home. There is this, the, the lure of the city lights. There's the promise of a, an exciting life, of a different life. And he can't wait to leave behind the father's house. When he leaves father's house with a wad full of money, and he arrives at the city with that pocket full of money, no doubt he was surrounded by plenty of friends. But as his money began to evaporate, so his friends began to evaporate too. And I guess society hasn't really changed much. Life for the young son goes very quickly on a downward spiral. We find him in the pig field. He has no money. He has no food. He has no home. Life has hit rock bottom for the young son. But it's interesting that life had to hit rock bottom before he remembered his father's house. But isn't that the same for many of us who have turned our backs on our heavenly father and on our heavenly father's house? We have to reach that place of rock bottom before we remember our heavenly father. When life hit rock bottom for him, he came to his senses. How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I'll get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. The prodigal knows and realises that he has given up his birthright. Make me, he says, as a servant. He knows he's unworthy. He knows he's undeserving. The realisation has dawned, as David expressed it in one of the Psalms, that it's better to be a doorkeeper in the house of God 
than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. He knows he has no entitlement. Like the publican in the other parable who prayed, God be merciful to me, the sinner. That's the kind of prayer this prodigal son had. Father, be merciful to me, I have sinned against you. He can only appeal to the Father's mercy. But the Father's mercy and the Father's grace goes away beyond his expectation. We read that when he was still a long way off, the Father saw him. And then we see another demonstration of this Father's extravagant love. He ran to meet him. That just didn't happen. The father figure would never run. The patriarch wouldn't run. Young men ran. Children ran and even women ran, but never the head of the household. But this father ran. He threw his arms around his son. He hugged him. He embraced him. It may have been difficult for him to start the long journey home, fully expecting to meet the full brunt of his father's wrath. But he meets a father who hugs him, who embraces him. It may have been difficult to start the journey home. He knows that he has humiliated his father. He knows that he has publicly rejected his father. But the father didn't treat him the way he deserved to be treated. When we have turned our backs on our heavenly father and indulged in a life of sin, it's difficult to start the road of repentance and even more so for the believer who has backslidden into sin knowing that we have publicly brought shame on Father's name. Often the church can be a very unforgiving place too. But the returning sinner here meets a God who says, bring him the best robe, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Come, bring the new robe, bring a clean robe. Reinstate him to a position of honour in my home. For this son of mine was lost and he's found. This son of mine, he was dead and he's alive again. He was dead and he's alive. There's a spiritual truth in there that impacts on each one of us. Because the starting point for each one of us spiritually is that we are spiritually dead. The Bible says dead in trespasses and sin. And the only way a spiritually dead man can be brought to life is if the Holy Spirit works in his heart. The Bible says that unless a man is born again, he can never see the kingdom of heaven. Bring him a new robe, bring him a clean robe. Let's celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. Let's kill the fatted calf. Meanwhile, the older brother was out in the field. And he heard the sound of music and dancing emanating from the father's house. And it's obvious that that was not a sound that was commonly heard. He comes to inquire of one of the servants. And the servant says to him, your brother has come, your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him home safe and sound. It seems that even the servant is glad that the prodigal son is back home, but not the older brother. We read that he became angry and was not willing to go in. He became angry. Now there may have been a number of reasons why he became angry. But one of them was a financial reason. You see, now that the younger son has been received back home and into the bosom of the family, he is again entitled to receive one third of the father's estate. In other words, the older brother has just witnessed his share of the inheritance being diminished by the returning prodigal son. He became angry. It's obvious he has no love for his brother. 
the father went out to plead with him to go into the feast. But what becomes obvious is that he has no love nor respect for his father either. Look, he said, for so many years I've been serving you. That was most certainly not the way the father figure ought to have been addressed. There was no love and no respect. Luke, for so many years I've been serving you. I've never neglected a command of yours, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, not my brother, but when this son of yours comes home, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. Here we begin to see the older brother's pharisaical attitude. This son of yours who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes. Remember in the other parable how the Pharisee prayed, I thank you that I'm not like other men, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And that is very much the attitude of the older brother here. I'm not like my younger brother. He has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, but I didn't do that. And then in the Pharisee's prayer, if we can call it a prayer, he went on to boast about his own record. I fast twice a week. I give a tithe on all that I earn. Listen to the older brother here. I have served you all those years. I have always been faithful to your every command. The boasting of the older brother here is very similar to the boasting of the Pharisee in his prayer. But the father had come out to invite him to go into the feast, to plead with him to go in. Did he go into the feast? Well, we don't know because Jesus doesn't tell us. But remember what Jesus had to say about those scribes and Pharisees earlier when he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer others to go in. And that's very much the heart and the attitude of the older brother here. He certainly didn't want his young brother to be at the feast, but nor was he willing to go in himself. He was just too proud of his own good record to go into the feast. But you see, what Jesus has managed to do here is he has managed to capture almost the entire population of the world. Almost the entire population of the world is represented by one of these two brothers. We have the younger brothers who have strayed far from father's house, who have gone into the far country and who have indulged in a life of sin, who have turned their back on any religious or moral teaching that they were brought up with, fully immersed in the world. And then there are those who are represented by the older brother. And sadly, most of the churches and most of the religions of the world fall into that category. People who live moral, upright lives and who abstain from all these things that the younger brother type indulge in. Who live moral, upright lives. But they live that way, fully expecting that father Heavenly Father will owe them. That Heavenly Father will owe them eternal life at the end of life's journey. Two brothers, two different types of lostness. But we see that the older brother is in far greater spiritual danger. Now, going back to where we find the parable in its context. We know that this is the third parable in Luke 15. And there is an emerging theme that runs through the parables in that 
something or somebody was lost in each of the parables. In the first parable, it was a sheep that was lost. In the second parable, it was a lost coin. And in the third parable, it was a lost son. But there's also another theme that begins to emerge in that when the sheep was lost, somebody went out and diligently searched for it until it was found. When the coin was lost, the woman swept the house and, and searched until she found the missing coin. But when the son was lost, nobody went out looking for him. Realistically, that ought to have been the responsibility of the older brother. But it's become obvious that he had no love for his brother, nor did he have any love or respect for his father either. He didn't go searching for the lost son. There's a true story told about an American pilot who was involved in the Vietnam War in the early 1960s. In November 1964, all contact with home suddenly stopped and his parents back home in California became increasingly distressed as the days became weeks and there was no word from him. He had one older brother who was only 25 years old, who was married and who had four children. But that older brother took a decision to sell off nearly all of his belongings to fund a trip to Vietnam, to undertake the 10,000 mile journey to go to the jungle to go looking for his brother. When he got there, he clothed himself in military attire and he mingled with the troops. He was there for months. He simply became known to them as the pilot's older brother. Eventually, he was captured by the Viet Cong and they held him prisoner for four months. On the day of his re release, they gave him his brother's jacket and told him that they had shot him down over the jungle. After nine months, he went home to his wife and family, but he had searched diligently for the lost young son in the parable the older brother didn't do that. How thankful then we ought to be that we have an older brother who is not like the one in the parable. Our older brother is Jesus and he left his privileged place at the Father's right hand to come into our world, a world that rejected him, a world that despised him, a world where he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But he came because of his love for the prodigal brother, those prodigal sons, those prodigal daughters who had strayed far from father's house and who had gone into the far country and who had indulged in a, in a life of sin. He came looking for the prodigal sons, the prodigal daughters. He came looking for you and for me. It cost the American pilot's brother dearly financially. But how much more did it cost our older brother? It cost Jesus his life. It cost Jesus his shed blood. And it even cost Jesus temporarily his relationship with his father. But he had come into the world motivated by his love for the prodigals to bring them home. How different our older brother is to the one in this parable. Now going back to the story of the young brother, we know that when life hit rock bottom in the pig field, it was then that he remembered home. He remembered home. Now, home can be a very elusive concept. And there are lots of people all over the world who are searching for this elusive concept called home. Some people will try going back to their roots 30, 40, 50, 60 years after they left to see if they can find this elusive concept called home. Others build or buy very expensive properties 
try to find the elusive concept called home. But you see, there's a very good spiritual reason why home is such an elusive concept. You see, we were made for a home that we are not occupying. The home we were created for was the Garden of Eden. We were made to live in the garden where we would enjoy perfect fellowship with a holy God. In the presence of a loving God, there was no sorrow, no pain, no death. But sin came into the garden. Adam and Eve sinned. Adam and Eve were evicted, removed from the garden. And man became a vagrant in the world. Nowhere is that seen more clearly than in the life of Adam and Eve's son, Cain. When Cain murdered his brother, God told him that he would be a vagrant, a fugitive in the world. Later on in that chapter, we read that Cain settled in Nod, east of Eden. East of Eden. And here we have the human problem in a nutshell. Made to live in Eden, but now living east of Eden. Man created to live in Eden, but now living east of Eden. And the story of the successive generations, as it is recorded in the Bible for us, is the history of a people who are searching for this elusive concept called home. We see it in the life of the Israelites. When they came back from Egypt and went into the promised land, even for them, this concept was of home was an elusive concept. We see it in the life of Jesus. When Jesus came into the world, he said, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, the son of man he has nowhere to lay down his head. But the Jesus the older brother had come to reconcile those prodigal younger brothers with a loving heavenly father. They crucified him outside the city, outside the city, signifying that there was no belonging to the city. He had come to bring the prodigals home. We see that when the young brother arrived at his father's house, the father put on a feast for him. And the same is true of the returning prodigals in the Bible too. There is a feast that is organised. It is found in the book of Revelation and it is called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. The older brother Jesus will bring those rebellious young sons, those sisters and those brothers. He will bring them from that separate place of separation, from that place east of Eden. The older brother will live them to their ultimate heavenly home in the new Jerusalem. And there they will meet with a loving father, a father who will embrace them, a father who will give them a clean robe. Who are they who are arrayed in robes of white? These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They will hunger no more and they will thirst no more. And God the Lord will wipe every tear from every eye. There they will be reconciled to a loving father finally brought home from that place of exile east of Eden to arrive at their heavenly destination in the New Jerusalem. But the Bible tells us something else about the New Jerusalem too. It tells us that the tree of life will be there. That's recorded in the very last chapter of the book of Revelation. Now the tree of life was there in the garden of Eden. But when man was separated from the presence of God, he was also separated from the presence of the tree of life. Sickness and sorrow and pain came into the man's experience. But there, in the New Jerusalem, it tells us that the tree of life is there 
for the healing of the nations, for the healing of the nations, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more pain, there will be no more parting, there will be no more sin, there will be no more death, for the former things have passed away. Only the older brother can bring us safely to the new Jerusalem. The question for you and for me today is, will we be found there in the new Jerusalem? Ultimately, everything that we hold precious in this life will be stripped away from us. Our friends, our family, our career, our educational achievements, our money, our property, everything. And life boils down to one question. Will my name, will your name be inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life? Will your name be inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life? Only those whose names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life will, be att will attend at the marriage supper of the Lamb. My friend, will you be there? Will I be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb in the new Jerusalem? Amen.